This video is brought to you by Mubi, a curated streaming service showing exceptional films from around the globe. Get a whole month free at mubi.com slash brodechanel. I have a podcast called Rehash. I co-host it with my best friend Hannah, and it's all about recent social media phenomenons that get us all up in arms, only to forget about them within a week. So we rehash them, as they say. Our third season looks at paradigm shifts on the internet, moments that change the way we do things, for better or for worse. We cover everything from by sister to Deb V. Heard to the end of Vine. The fourth season is coming out very soon. Go check it out. On January 2nd, The Real Housewives of Salt Lake City aired a finale which has been described by many as the best episode of reality television in history. In the finale, which is the culmination of a four episode trip to Bermuda, it's revealed that the newest housewife, Monica Garcia, is not really who she says she is. Monica joined at the beginning of the season and had become a fan favorite through the duration of her short time on the show. She was funny, had much less money than the other women, a juicy backstory that consists of adultery and being excommunicated from the Mormon church, and she wasn't afraid to call the other ladies out on their bull when need be. Up until this point, the Real Housewives of Salt Lake City had been kind of flopping, since its drama had been so centered around the exploits and violent temper of former castmate Jen Shaw, who was apprehended by the FBI on camera for helming a massive money laundering scheme that targeted and defrauded the elderly. Jen was sentenced to six years in prison, and her absence left a bit of a void on the show in terms of drama, making plucky Monica a beloved addition. So when Heather Gay gathers her fellow castmates on the Bermuda beach, all adorned in their finest tropical gowns, hair blowing in the wind, and reveals that Monica is not just Monica Garcia, mother of four and ex-adulterer, but actually the troll behind Reality Von Tees, a gossip Instagram account which started out as a page that leaked insider information about Jen Shaw, since Monica was Shaw's ex-employee, but later divulged intimate gossip about the other women as well. Viewers gaped as the women, sitting Arthurian style around a formation of tables dubbed the Bermuda Triangle, confront Monica about her deception. They gasped as Monica, completely unabashed, admits to her role in the account, citing her co-conspirators, spitting out a few insults, and shrugging her shoulders before walking away into the night. They wiped their tears away as the remaining women huddle around the table, united in the face of adversity. Okay, goofy as this is, the impact of the episode was huge. It was the most watched episode of the show since its pilot, coming in at 2 million viewers in a single night. Jennifer Lawrence talked about it on the red carpet at the Golden Globes. I was jaw on the floor. I didn't even text. I didn't even look at my phone. There's all these memes of people being like, give these women the Oscar. Do you feel like they did? I'll give them mine. I don't care. And Kevin Fallon described it as his red wedding. The Salt Lake City finale was such a big deal that it momentarily made everyone forget about another major reality TV scandal from just last year, one that's also credited for reviving its show, and was similarly described as a modern twist on the where was I when Kennedy was shot moment. Yes, last year, the Housewives spinoff show Vanderpump Rules, which follows the shenanigans of a group of staffers from former Beverly Hills housewife Lisa Vanderpump's West Hollywood restaurant, Sir, made national headlines on some of the most prestige outlets after airing its finale episode, Hashtag Scandival. In this episode, it's revealed that cast member Tom Sandoval had been cheating on his castmate and partner of nine years, Ariana Maddox, with other fellow cast member Raquel Levis. This was information that had been leaked to the public mid-season, but now we got to see it unfold with our own eyes. Not only was Scandival also hailed as the best episode of reality television in history, it broke records for the network and even won Vanderpump Rules an Emmy nomination. Unreal. And while these two scandals were so entertaining to watch, while they revived stale, maybe even dying shows, and while they left us all with our mouths hanging open, I have to ask, why? Why was a cheating scandal such a big deal on a show literally predicated on cheating scandals? Why was a character assassinating gossip account such a big deal on a show predicated on women assassinating each other's characters? And better yet, while we all had our mouths hanging open, why does it seem like the audience response to these two scandals was so different? It's time to find out. Hi, I'm Reality, and yes, I do bite. Something very important to understand about these shows is their genre. 
Yes, Real Housewives and Vanderpump Rules are reality television, but I think it's clear that they're very different from a show like, say, Love Island, for example. Where Love Island is gamified in the tradition of shows like Survivor, Housewives and Vanderpump are more like the real world. They're premised on the idea of following the real lives of ordinary people and the interpersonal relationships between them. This genre of reality TV is called the docu-soap, a show that centers upon real people but is designed to emulate the twists, salaciousness, and emotionality of a soap opera. On gamified shows, the conflicts are very clearly instigated, or at least guided, by production through the competition element. So there's a bit more understanding as an audience member that what you're watching is somewhat mediated, somewhat unreal. But in a docu-soap, which is about these people's real families, friendships, and romances, the boundaries between the real and the unreal become more blurred. But don't get it twisted. It's still mediated. Reality TV scholars have argued that unlike other reality genres, docu-soaps are pretty hard to produce because their narratives aren't predetermined, in the way a makeover or home reno show would have a big reveal moment, or a gamified show would have a winner. So instead, the docu-soap relies on what they call a melodramatic money shot. I'll let you guess where that term comes from. But essentially, as Laura Grindstaff defines it, the melodramatic money shot makes visible the precise moment of letting go, of losing control, of surrendering to the body and its animal emotions. Moments that are emotionally heightened, iconic, and most importantly, viral. And as Jacqueline Arce argues, these moments are often pretty contrived. She says docu-soap stars have to manufacture a money shot out of mundane, everyday life. The most pronounced strategy used by docu-soap stars is to create a money shot moment through interpersonal conflict. Think Teresa Judice flipping the table on New Jersey, or Lisa Rinna smashing the glass at Kim Richards on Beverly Hills, or Tom Sandoval no, just, of Vanderpump I'm doing this. Like, you don't ever like feel anything. It's like you this conversation. You ever feel this? Oh my God. These moments are, as Arcy puts it, carefully calibrated in order to serve the melodrama, the soap of it all. And often on Bravo shows, they're played again and again and again in recaps. Like, I cannot tell you how many times I've watched Rinna throw that glass. So the docu in docu-soap purports to capture the lifestyles of real people. But the soap in docu-soap is to contrive sensationalized emotions and heightened drama. In a study on performativity in television, John Ellis writes about audience trust in reality stars and says, in the prevailing morality of TV, trust requires that a person be open and sincere. To be caught being two-faced, duplicitous, or hypocritical is one of the worst sins of reality TV. But when it comes to docu-soaps, I think this is categorically untrue. In true soap tradition, deceit and subterfuge are kind of par for the course. Take the persisting fan bases of housewives like Jen Shaw and Erica Jane, one of whom was literally convicted of scamming the elderly, and the other was allegedly complicit in her lawyer husband Tom Girardi stealing millions of dollars in reparations from his clients, families of the literal Boeing air crash victims. I'm not saying I don't feel for yeah. the potential victims. Yeah. Potential victims. All I think about are victims. I don't give a f about anybody else but me. These ladies gave us good TV, though. Their terrible behavior lasted for seasons of drama and intrigue, and so we have to stand, apparently. Like former New York housewife Bethany Frankel said on her podcast, Sometimes reality TV is like the upside down. People are rewarded for bad behavior. Negativity, like I've said, bankruptcy. In no other world does the boss, the entity, like pull in and highlight addiction drinking, affairs, bankruptcy, going to jail, like that's, you know, in other workplaces, that's frowned upon. Yes. So reality TV is the upside down. Shaw's arrest happened just two seasons before Monica's reveal. And just one season before Scandival, Vanderpump cast member Lala Kent's baby daddy, film producer Randall Emmett, was being investigated as a mini Harvey Weinstein. Yet somehow, a housewife running a gossip account and two reality stars having an affair managed to cause greater waves than any of these crimes. How could something as relatively mundane as adultery or gossip blogging be the events to galvanize audiences? Real Housewives is a particularly theatrical style of docu-soap. The show began with a focus on women referred to as housewives, because they're typically the partners or ex-partners of rich and or famous men, and because the show was created as Bravo's response to the hit soap, Desperate Housewives. 
It was that classic 2000s lifestyles of the rich and famous type show, a fetishistic glimpse into their conspicuous wealth. These are women who, in the post-feminist tradition of the 90s and aughts, have it all and occupy an elite social circle. But this isn't so much the focus anymore. There are very little requirements for real interpersonal relations between the women. Actually, it seems like the show is likely to end real life friendships, if anything. As Eve Saris notes, these women do not have to be married, stay at home mothers, or even friends with each other to be on the show, although the title suggests otherwise. Women are cast if they live glamorously, are entrepreneurial, confrontational, dedicated to looking good, and open to having emotional breakdowns on camera. The women of Real Housewives are ridiculous, aspirational, and over the top. Some of them are even soap stars, as is the case with Lisa Rinna and Eileen Davidson of Beverly Hills. And the show over time especially is not so concerned with telling the truth of their lives as it is in highlighting contrived drama between them for that coveted money shot as we discussed. With Housewives, there's a degree of self-awareness on the part of the production as to the ridiculousness of the action. Actually, Andy Cohen himself in a 2010 interview with New York Magazine calls their editing style the Bravo Wink. He insisted back then that as producers, they don't judge the housewives and that instead they leave it up to the audience. But what the wink suggests is that they in fact do judge and are winking at us to let us in on the joke. For example, if a housewife says one thing, the editors will add in a shot from seasons ago that contradicts it, pointing out their hypocrisy. It's very editorialized and ironic, which makes it a lot of fun to watch. So this makes it quite easy to laugh with or at the women, even cheer them on when they're being morally abhorrent. And this theatrical ironic framing was used to an almost unprecedented extent in the Salt Lake City finale. Everything is so heightened. The sepia filter on the beach, all of the OG women filing out one by one to meet Heather, the choral music, the wind, the Bermuda Triangle. During the confrontation, the choral music is so loud, it's like the singers are screaming. It was delicious. Shakespearean, says Fallon, is often used to justify the histrionic drama of Real Housewives, but it's never been more apt. Phenomenal pacing, brimming with delicious teases, throwbacks, intense buildup, and dramatic reveals led up to the climax, a wild twist that no one saw coming. So the audience was, as they say, living, goaded into a juicy, exciting, and truly fun surprise. But why? On a show where a woman is apprehended by the FBI on camera, when Lisa Barlow was hot mic'd a couple seasons ago revealing intimate secrets about her best friend Meredith, when Mary M. Cosby was suspected of running a cult, when there's subterfuge at every turn, was this propped up as such a betrayal by the housewives? Well, the show knows it's ridiculous, but often the women do too. In a 2020 study of Real Housewives, Saras finds that the women who align their off-screen social media presence with their on-screen televised presence are often most successful. This is how they're able to be in on the joke with the audience in production. But to create a successful off-screen persona that aligns with the show takes a degree of labor on the part of the housewife and an awareness of their role on the show as a job rather than a lifestyle. Saras calls this kind of labor emotional camping which she says is comprised of one, emotional labor, or the process of formulating the necessary emotions for the job, and two, camping, which is the actual performance of this loss of control, or the performative outcome of this labor. This type of communicative competence formulates the basis of the housewife's self-branding strategy. One former housewife that Saras interviews told her that the best housewives are the ones that you can parody and imitate. Another one said, you can be anyone you want. If you're a normal person in real life and you want to play the villain, you can play the villain. If you're a crazy person in real life and you want people to feel like you're an angel, you can do that too. You can really be any persona you want to because there's no fact checking. But housewives don't just engage in emotional camping to get more camera time. They do it as a form of self-protection. As this other housewife said, I called the two new housewives. I told them to think of themselves as a television character and then try to separate their personal life. Mickey Mouse is this fake character. You can't talk smack on Mickey Mouse because he's a fake character, but you talk smack on a reality star, it hurts because it's real. So I told them, remove yourself. It's hard to think of yourself as a kind of out of body character, but that's really what this is. This is the approach of someone who knows about the unreality of reality TV and how easy it is to be abused by the public if things get too real. So as Saras concludes, 
This is the work of emotional camping, which affords them the chance to build a stronger branded persona online, shield themselves against negative perceptions, and secure a sense of privacy in very public-facing careers. In the surveillance society, living a hyper-exposed life both on camera and online can be a slippery slope. The line between the public and the private world becomes dangerously fragile, and you can lose yourself in your personal life to the cannibalistic world of gossip, tabloids, and images. So the only option for these women is to dissociate, wear a disguise, an exaggerated version of the person within. As you can glean from that housewife testimonial, it seems like this self-branding is something that's quite understood amongst the housewives. And oftentimes on the show, the housewives, no matter their beef with each other, will unite in the face of unruly or out-of-pocket fans. It's almost like there's a sacred wall of protection between these elite, untouchable women and their rabid, sometimes bloodthirsty fandom. When Monica is unmasked, the ladies cast her as an interloper, with Heather frequently asserting that Monica did not belong with them at the table. Because not only does she fall short of the housewife expectation of having it all, being relatively broke, she also commits the cardinal sin of the Housewives franchise. She is a fan. Now, fan participation is common in reality shows, especially gamified ones. Like, Alaska was openly a super fan of RuPaul's Drag Race, auditioning several times before finally being cast in season five. Competition shows like Drag Race allow and even encourage this breaking of the fourth wall because they're presenting a rags to riches story where they have the power to better the lives of their casts. But in docu-soaps like Housewives, where the reality aspect is about the aspirational lifestyles of untouchable people, to be a fan is to be touchable, to break the facade. This facade being the invisible, imaginary wall that separates and protects the housewives from their viewers. On a show like Housewives, the stars have built this wall by cultivating dissociated, larger-than-life versions of themselves, personas so big that they can separate and even cast a shielded shadow over their personal lives. The bigger the character, the longer the shadow. And yet, by sharing intimate information with the public, Monica effectively undermined and broke down that wall, shattering their protective personas and exposing herself as a fan, a spy, and most egregiously, a troll. In digging for a truth that Real Housewives isn't usually interested in, Monica committed the ultimate betrayal. In what is one of the most seminal works in reality television scholarship, Ordinary People and the Media, Graham Turner coins the term the demotic turn, which he defines as the increasing visibility of the ordinary person as they have turned themselves into media content through celebrity culture, reality TV, DIY websites, talk radio, and the like. For Turner, audiences have turned themselves into media content by becoming significantly more involved in the process of making it. YouTube is a great example of that, with regular people, like myself, producing much of the content that goes on here. But back when Turner wrote this in 2009, reality TV was the number one medium to point to, with regular people getting spotlighted on these shows and becoming celebrities themselves. On Real Housewives, though, the women aren't exactly ordinary people. They're often married to the rich and or famous, maybe even B-list famous themselves, and so are closer to conventional celebrities than the stars of, say, a TLC show. They're bravo celebrities of the first order. So Monica being a fan and a social media troll who infiltrates their carefully mediated environments might just be the final realization of the demotic turn, penetrating even the most impenetrable of reality shows. Social media has given us greater access to even the most A-list of celebrities. And if Monica did leverage her intel on the women to get on the show, as many have speculated, then we may just be seeing a total fan takeover of our media channels. In his recap of the Salt Lake City finale, Fallon describes Monica as one of reality TV's all-time best villains. But he says that this is a bit of a dilemma, wondering, was she too good? She may have made great TV, but did she also make it so that she could, or should, never be invited back to film again? Well, as it turns out, it was reported on January 23rd that Monica will not be coming back for the next season. People think it's because of her performance on the reunion, where she refused to apologize to the women and instead doubled down with pretty nasty insults. People have actually argued that because of her quick tongue, Monica has a sensibility that's closer to the women of Bad Girls Club than Housewives. Hell, I'd argue she'd even be a better fit on Vanderpump. But it just didn't work here, and instead kind of alienated her from the cast. Even Andy Cohen said, I think that if Monica had come out and was able to sway even one of the women back on her side, then it might be a different conversation right now. 
It especially didn't help when she threw production under the bus and revealed that they knew about her identity all along. A big no-no, because now the wives are pissed at production too. This decision though, which people think was something out of Monica's control, has been extremely divisive amongst fans, with a lot of people saying that her departure or firing will ruin the franchise. And while Monica is getting the mother treatment from audiences and being celebrated for her deceit, being rewarded for bad behavior like Frankel said, the same cannot be said for Raquel Levis. Why? Filming for season 10 of Vanderpump Rules had been finished for about five months when production got a call from Ariana saying that her long-term partner Tom had been conducting a seven-month-long mid-season affair with castmate Raquel right under everyone's noses. And in an almost unprecedented move, the showrunners picked the cameras back up to capture the fallout. This is where we get Scandable, the official final episode of the show filmed months after the rest, which begins with Ariana confronting Tom in their home and telling him she hopes he dies. It's very intense. For seasons now, Ariana had been a stabilizing presence on a show full of some of the messiest people you'll ever encounter, being the resident chill girl of the group next to her very catty female castmates, and even sticking up for Raquel on a number of occasions during the season, even against allegations of the affair. Raquel, on the other hand, was a relatively newer cast member, having joined in season five as house DJ James Kennedy's girlfriend and later fiance. The two had recently split up and this season, it was clear that Raquel was spiraling a bit. At first, you can tell that she's being set up by the producers as the show's main girl, but she quickly falls out of favor with the other women on the show after pursuing Tom Schwartz, Katie Maloney's recent ex-husband, and Oliver Saunders, who Lala Kent initially wanted to pursue. So Raquel wasn't loved by audiences or her co-stars in the way that Ariana was by the time the scandal broke. And as the season continues, she's seen more and more frequently with Tom and Ariana, showing up with them to events, and in one very mind-boggling scene, questioning Ariana about their lackluster intimate life. So when the revelation of the affair happens in the final episode, I was indignant. I thought Raquel was a monster, a sociopath. I had just watched her ingratiate herself with a woman she was actively betraying for 14 whole episodes, even going so far as to chastise Oliver for not disclosing to her that he was still living with his ex-wife when they hooked up. She was a hypocrite, a ghoul. It seems everyone was as invested as I was because as Levis said in an interview with Frankel after the show. Yeah, Alex Baskin went on record himself. He's our executive producer okay. of Vanderpump Rules. And he said the show was going to be canceled after season 10. And yet season 10 is the most watched season of Vanderpump Rules spiking with a 77% viewer increase since last season, and the reunion episode that followed went on to be the most watched episode of any Bravo series in over nine years. And then Scandable ended, and I had a weird hold up moment. Hold up, I said. Wasn't Vanderpump Rules created because Elisa told Bravo producers that all her staff were hooking up with each other? That specifically one of her staff, Sheena Shea, had been a mistress to the husband of the then pregnant housewife, Brandy Glanville, and this is the scandal that kicked off the show. Since season one, cast members have been cheating. Tom and Ariana literally began their relationship through infidelity, with the two of them very remorselessly insisting that they only kissed while he was in a five year relationship with cast member Kristen, although I'm pretty comfortable alleging that they definitely did more than that. Kristen herself then cheated on Tom with his best friend and cast member Jax, the on and off again partner of Kristen's best friend and fellow cast member Stassi. Tom Schwartz cheats on Katie. James cheats on Raquel with Lala, which is revealed the same season as Scandival. Glanville put it aptly when she tweeted after Scandival, I just didn't understand the outrage considering the group's history. That is all. My confusion got even worse during the reunion. In the finale, the other cast members who've been feuding all season come together very tearily around Ariana and disavow Tom and Raquel, with Sheena saying she physically assaulted Raquel upon finding out and telling Tom that she won't be his friend anymore. And then the reunion happens and basically the entire cast, yes, including Ariana, lay into Raquel in an unconscionable way, given that this is not happening in private, but on national television. Diabolical, demented, disgusting, subhuman. I feel like my actions are human. It's not exactly at that. All. No, no. I, can no, I tell you? Not, no. That's not human behavior. Not at all. You're a psychopath. You are terrifying to me as a person. You're soul-sucking individual. You're, you're completely right. You are lower than 
lowest of low people. You're ugly. You're hideous. I know. You're I rotten been. on the I inside. Know. Like a moldy piece of fruit. No, oh, because Lala's <laughs> a nickname, you moron. It's not a name that I changed. Raquel is a nickname. So your family calls you Rachel. Mm -hmm. Your friends call you Raquel. You have no more friends, right? But your life is getting better by the minute. Yes. And theirs is just going down the gutter. Karma. Yeah, and for the record, Raquel, okay, when you call Ellie a replacement, watch your mouth, because it's not a replacement when it's a clearly an upgrade, okay? Clearly yeah, it's you're an the upgrade. downgrade, babe. Okay. Hold on, come back. Yeah, bye bye, darling. You should bye -bye. leave, honestly. You Don't should leave back. and never come back. No one wants you, bye. Bye bye. Friendships. Nothing. You are nothing. You are nothing. Let that sink in. Fuck yourself with a cheese grater. F you. You suck. You're disgusting. And I wish nothing but the worst that could ever happen to a person on you. And I do have to remind everyone that many of these people are nearing 40. For all Raquel's wrongdoing, it's a brutal watch. Of course, while this aired, the audience had to join in on the pylon. Ellis, writing in a pre-social media age, argues that conversations about reality TV are gossip that will not get back to the subjects of that gossip. But as we know, the advent of social media has given us full proximity to these stars. And since the show, Raquel and her loved ones have received constant harassment and abuse from the public, including death threats. This harassment has been fueled and encouraged by her co-stars. Why? Well, in an interesting but unsurprising turn of events, both the production and the stars of Vanderpump have profited exponentially from the scandal. Ariana was cast in a Lifetime movie. She appeared on Dancing with the Stars. She dropped a merch line, which was grossing six figures at the time of the reunion. She's gone on a number of late night shows. She released a cocktail book called Single AF. Needless to say, she's doing very, very well. Cast members Kristen and Stassi, who were fired from the show back in 2020 for falsely and intentionally calling the police on their black coworker, have benefited from the scandal. The cast members that were fired and canceled at that time now have this big comeback because this scandal is so salacious that we are the ultimate villains, Tom and I, and now they have a platform to redeem themselves. Even Tom Sandoval has benefited. He did tell me during negotiations for season 11 that he was offered a producer credit for season 11. Raquel, on the other hand, has not. She asked for equal pay to Tom and Ariana if she was going to come back on the show and endure more abuse from her co-stars. After all, the show has profited from her actions and her public humiliation, and it would benefit greatly from her staying on, but she was denied. Also, I asked for my tuition, I guess, to be covered for my treatment, and they refused to pay for it. I have a theory that is because if they paid for it, they would admit to yes. this liability. Yeah, it sounds like Lisa Vanderpump is profiting, Bravo's profiting, Annie Cohen's definitely profiting, Tom is profiting, Ariana is profiting, and you're in a deficit, you're in debt. Mm -hmm. So many people are using this opportunity and this scandal to monetize for their own benefit, and I'm left here broke. <laughs> and my name has been raked through the coals. I don't have business opportunities. My brand is shot. Given what we know about Monica being rewarded for her actions by Bravo right up until the reunion because of the housewives, it's interesting that Raquel has not gotten the same treatment from the public or from her showrunners. This is for a couple reasons. The first reason is that Raquel isn't exactly playing the game. On the show, you can see that she's quite earnest, not really able to verbally spar with her abrasive castmates. She's not as versed as them in being on a soap, less able or willing to give that money shot. People often comment on how her conversations seem rehearsed, and she seems to have trouble going off script when it doesn't play out like she planned. Conversely, someone like Tom, who's been on the show since season one, is well acquainted with the part he plays. In her exclusive on the situation for Variety, Kate Arthur acknowledges that the fallout for Raquel was much worse than for Tom, despite the fact that he was the one in the committed relationship. And she observes, Sandoval, a former model, actor, and bartender, and a current restaurateur and musician, pays close attention to performance. And it may be that his shape-shifting qualities have made it harder for the full blame of the Scandoval to stick to him. Tom's playing the game, Raquel isn't. And so she's being more or less bulldozed while the others milk the situation for all it's worth. Even Alex Baskin remarked that it seemed Raquel was especially cast adrift during filming that season. 
And of his complicity in neglecting to help or guide her, he says, but we have to be removed. And this is where we get to the other reason, genre. Vanderpump is a docu-soap, but unlike Housewives, over the years, it's actually leaned away from its soapier elements. Its stars are younger and broker than the Housewives when it starts. They don't have the same safety nets of wealth or life experience to fall back on when they trip up. Their motivations at 20 are not the same at 30 or 40. So as the show goes on, we watch them allegedly grow up, get married, have kids, buy houses. By season 10, Sandoval and Ariana had, from the outside, been in a stable and loving endgame relationship, which made the shock hit much harder. Especially because, when compared to Housewives, it's clear that the cast members of Vanderpump do actually have much less work-life boundaries in their social relationships. Like many times this season, it's remarked that Katie and Lala have no friends outside the show. Added to that, the show in season 10 is edited almost like a documentary. It's much less amped up or played for comedy in the way that Housewives is, having almost none of that Bravo wink. Like, take this scene for instance, where Katie, Lala, and Christina go on a girl's trip to celebrate Katie's divorce and spend half a day at a boat party that consists of very gray skies, an ugly lake, and a half-filled boat occupied by these guys. This should have been played for laughs, but is instead played as a girl power moment. It's clear from his comment about being removed that Baskin is attempting a veneer of objectivity. He insists that production knew nothing about the affair and that the speculations from the cast were happening in real time without producer interference. When talking about adding the Scandival episode, he also says, they got us all the necessary approvals and clearances so that we could tell the story in real time. That's why what you're seeing is pure verite. Lisa also emphasizes the realness of it all. How can you get any more real? I have never met such a group of people that are so willing to film it all. That's a magic that you can't create. But it's all in the editing. The bomb drop in season two that Kristen had in fact hooked up with Jax was uttered extremely passingly by Stassi at the beginning of an episode, with barely any music to underscore it. The bomb drop about Scandival was given an entire episode and played out almost journalistically, rewinding and fast forwarding so the audience can uncover the mystery with them. The betrayal is not only underscored, but it unfolds in such a way that the audience barely notices the production behind it. The real overtook the unreal. That's what got it an Emmy. And added to her unwillingness to lean in and play the game, that's what made Raquel a much harder villain to stand, despite the equal and sometimes even worse behavior we've seen on this very show. Within the rules of the docu-soap, a cheating scandal shouldn't have sunk Raquel the way it did if it weren't for this turn towards cinema verite. Because of the realness of Vanderpump season 10, the perception was that Raquel hadn't just betrayed her castmates, she had betrayed the viewers. My general rule of thumb for thinking about genre and what it means is that genre establishes a set of rules and expectations for what you're about to see, which the audience then tacitly consents to. It's like how you wouldn't be shocked or outraged if someone's head gets cut off in a horror film, but you would if Zac Efron randomly did that to one of his opponents in The Iron Claw, a classic weepy. Housewives and Vanderpump both belong to the docu-soap genre, but over the years, they've kind of splintered off into their own things, with Housewives leaning into theatrics and camp, and Vanderpump sliding into a cinema verite, what are my friends up to kind of show. And those have different expectations, or what I'll call here, social contracts, between the show and its audience. In my video on Love Island, I talked about the ways that reality TV can exploit its participants and regulate their behavior with the surveillance apparatuses of the camera and the public eye. But shows like Housewives, where it feels like both audience and stars are consenting to the performance, leads to an entirely different engagement with the product. One that's more ironic and arguably less vitriolic. That isn't to say the housewives don't suffer abuse from the public, but that the events of their shows are handled less gravely than a show like Vanderpump. On Vanderpump, the audience isn't in on the joke because there is no joke to be let in on, at least not in the current toned down phase of its subjects' lives. So the fallout of Scandival felt juicy, but ultimately quite sad and uncomfortable, as opposed to the finale of Salt Lake City, which felt oddly joyful among fans. I'm still liking every meme that pops up on my feed because, well, it doesn't feel mean-spirited to do so. While Salt Lake City's audience wasn't privy to Monica's true identity, the only real betrayal was against her fellow housewives. It was a huge deal because she shattered the illusory mode of housewife survival and self-protection, and so broke a sacred bond with them. 
But audiences could continue to stand because it was treated so unseriously by the show's ironic framing. Obviously, adultery and trolling occupy different levels of severity. But again, Vanderpump is literally about the adulterous actions of a certain friend group. Raquel's betrayal on Vanderpump was a big deal because her salacious, soapy actions were treated very gravely by the show's serious framing, and was thus depicted as a betrayal of the audience too. I was watching that whole time and they did it right under my nose. So both scandals were a big deal for their respective reasons, despite the fact that the scandals were relatively mundane within the premises of each show, but they were received very differently by audiences because of the different social contracts of each show. You can't help but wonder how Monica's betrayal would fare if she was cast as a member on Vanderpump instead. What Tom and Raquel did was immoral and extremely hurtful towards Ariana, but they're on a docu-soap. Their behavior was great for the show, and even for their castmates. I personally think that Raquel has paid her dues and more. And while I think her choice to stay off the show is a very healthy one and the right choice to make, I also think Bravo should value her more. Because ultimately, they're no better than she is. Well, actually, they're much worse. In a behind-the-scenes episode of Vanderpump Rules Season 1, the producers openly brag about an instance where, upon learning that Jax had impregnated a girl in Las Vegas while in a relationship with Stassi, they get Kristen to call her and inform her about it before showing up unannounced to Stassi's house where she's not camera-ready and crying in the arms of her friends. The director of photography for that season reveals that before Vanderpump, she worked in documentaries and calls that scene the first time when it really felt like we weren't shooting a reality show. We were shooting a documentary. But did Stassi or any of the cast of Vanderpump Rules agree to being the subjects of a documentary when they signed up for this? Bethany Frankel, for admittedly very self-serving intentions, has spoken out about the exploitative working environments fostered by Bravo, threatening to sue, or worse, unionize with her fellow castmates. She and Raquel go in-depth about the network's coercion, manipulation, and lack of care towards their stars on her podcast. But when asked by Vanity Fair about whether reality TV can be made humanely, another housewife who chose to remain anonymous said, I take umbrage with humanely. Have you ever seen what it takes to train a Navy SEAL or to become a professional athlete? There's nothing humane about the process to do it. And there's nothing humane about the game of football. And I effing love it. She's right. Reality TV isn't humane, but it's more fun for everyone if we play by the rules of its game. Cool. Wrapped. This video is sponsored by Movie, a curated streaming service dedicated to elevating great cinema from all around the globe. It's for lovers of great cinema and those who don't know they love great cinema yet. Because the beauty of Movie is that it exposes you to artful, thought-provoking, and innovative films you would never think to watch. It's your lucky day, actually, because Aki Kurosaki's Fallen Leaves is now available for streaming. I had the pleasure of seeing this film at TIFF, and I can tell you it's a delightful watch. Fallen Leaves, a movie release, is the fourth film in Kurosaki's Proletariat series. It's about a working-class woman named Ansa who meets a scrappy man named Halapa, a cynical alcoholic who works at a nearby factory. The two connect over their shared loneliness, and romance ensues. What struck me about Fallen Leaves is its gentle humor, and the tender gaze it casts on its hardened lovers. If you're looking for a sweet, feel-good film, Fallen Leaves is the place to go. You can find it right now on Movie. Discover the best of cinema at your fingertips, streaming anytime, anywhere. You can try Movie free for 30 days at movie.com slash brodechanel. That's m-u-b-i dot com slash brodechanel for a whole month of great cinema, for free. Special thank you to Louis Osta, Syed Hassan, Mal Pertui, Morgan, Cooper Stimson, Nadia C, Nick, Jenny Eller, J. Frost McFinnigan, Gabriel M, The Wiz Daniel, Edward Yu, Connor O'Keefe, Sharma, Daniel Sardunas, Jenya, Scott Barnett, Julia Campana, Alexis, Navis Bullock, Carrie Gavin, RSS, Friedrich Hallstrom, Alex Short, and Kelly Wolf for supporting this channel.